Professor C uh, Ferguson uh, has uh, also done a lot of television shows. Uh, some of you might be familiar with The Ascent of Money that uh, is running on many a TV ch uh, channel and has the pleasure of being a rerun on uh, Al Jazeera. I'm not quite sure what, what that says about Ferguson. He follows up uh, on a grand tradition here at the Nobel Institute. Uh, over the past decade since we brought the Visiting Fellows program back to life, we've had a number of notable Visiting Fellows. Paul Kennedy, N uh, Joe Nye, Currently, this year, we have had uh, Professor Bill uh, uh, Hitchcock, Robert Cooper has been here, the editor from the Financial Times, Gideon Rachman has been here. But never before have we had to open up the small hall and uh, blow up the doors to the great hall where we are now. Uh, that's also interesting, it coincides with the visiting fellow who's here. The shortest par excellence, uh, Professor Ferguson is only here for a few hours, but I am glad that so many of you have come to spend at least two of those hours with us here today. Professor Ferguson, the floor is yours. The topic of the day is degeneration and regeneration after the Cold War. Thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. It's an enormous honor and privilege to be invited here uh, to the Nobel Institute uh, to address you this afternoon. I can only apologize for the brevity of my visit. This is an uncommonly busy time for me. That's probably somebody phoning to ask me to come to another European city. As I've just published my latest book in the United States, and it was only with difficulty that I was able to fight off the Penguin Books publicity department, who reacted with dismay when I told them that I was heading to Oslo where they wrongly assumed relatively few copies of the book would sell. I hope you will prove them wrong. <laughs> I, I want to speak to you this afternoon about degeneration. But before I define what I mean by that, I want to take you back in time as we historians like to do. I want to take you back nearly a quarter of a century to the summer of 1989. Think back. Where were you? One member of our audience right at the back wasn't even born. But the rest of us will have memories of that time. I was in Berlin, and I was in the final phase of researching a doctoral dissertation on the hyperinflation that racked Germany after World War I, an event, it must be said, that continues to play a part in European politics to this day. I was very struck that summer by a change. And the change was that suddenly I was no longer alone in the S-Bahn from Friedrichstraße to Zoologische Garten. In those days, only a very few people could make that journey. To be precise, it was only British American and French citizens who could travel from Friedrichstraße in Ostberlin to Zoologische Garten in West by S-Bahn. And normally, one traveled alone. In the summer of 1989, that changed. 
and one found oneself accompanied by people from other East European countries, Poles, Hungarians. What was happening, we now realize, was the degeneration of the Soviet Empire in Eastern Europe. That degeneration so impressed me that I wrote an article for one of the British newspapers, which I gave the provisional headline, The Berlin Wall is Crumbling. Had that article been published, <laughs> I could claim to be one of the tiny number of people who foresaw the fall of the Berlin Wall. But it was not, because, and I quote a sub-editor on that newspaper, the editor thinks, Neil, you've been listening to one too many Ronald Reagan speeches. <laughs> By the way, ladies and gentlemen, wasn't it odd that the other day President Obama traveled to Berlin and stood at the Brandenburg Gate in his shirt sleeves, alluding to President Kennedy's much shorter speech, Ich bin ein Berliner, but making no reference whatsoever to Ronald Reagan's speech, a speech which I think one can say did indeed change the course of history. Mr. Gorbachev, tear this wall down. Well, that wall was torn down. And as a result, another academic, more eminent than me, became the man who foresaw the fall of the Berlin Wall, namely Francis Fukuyama. That summer, Fukuyama had published his essay, The End of History. And as the Berlin Wall crumbled, Fukuyama stood vindicated. 24 years on, it's funny to go back to that essay and see what he wrote. I quote, an unabashed victory of economic and political liberalism, a triumph of the West. This was Fukuyama's definition of the end of history as he saw it in the summer of 1989. The end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. 24 years on, it doesn't quite look to me like the triumph of the West much less the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. If the International Monetary Fund is to be believed, within three years, the gross domestic product of China, measured on a purchasing par parity adjusted basis, will exceed that of the United States. For the first time since 1882, it would be possible for another country to claim that its economy is larger than that of the United States of America. Sam Huntington was another writer of the post-Cold War era to enjoy great and in many ways justified influence. Huntington's definition of the West was a rather different one from Fukuyama's, but if one takes that definition and looks at it demographically, we are hardly living through the triumph of the West. In 1950, Huntington's West, using his geographical definition, accounted for 20%, just over a fifth of the world's population. The United Nations projects a population for future decades, according to its medium range projection, that share by 2050 will have declined to just above 
demographically, the West is certainly not triumphing. Or view the end of history from the vantage point of an investor. Suppose you as an investor had believed Francis Fukuyama in the summer of 1989 and had invested your savings exclusively in the West, in Europe and North America. Well, in nominal terms, your European portfolio would have increased by a factor of 3.6 since then. Your North American portfolio would have done better. It would have increased by a factor of, of 5.2 in nominal dollar terms. But your rival, who disbelieved Fukuyama, and invested all her money in non-Western markets would have cleaned your clock, to use a colloquial Wall Street expression, because emerging markets in the same 24-year period rose by a factor of 6.2. In investment terms, the West certainly hasn't triumphed. The smart thing was to invest against the Fukuyama thesis. It turns out that the real historical trend was quite different from the one that Fukuyama identified. The biggest story of our lifetimes is probably best described as the great reconvergence, the end of that 500-year period of divergence which put the West in a position of quite exceptional dominance over the rest of the world. The Great Divergence made Westerners much richer than everybody else, made them healthier and longer lived than everybody else, made them more powerful than everybody else, made their culture more influential than everybody else's. The end of the Great Divergence is the big story of our time. Not the triumph of the West, but the end of the triumph of the West. To illustrate this point in strictly economic terms, in 1979, which was, I think, in many ways a more significant year than 1989, as I've argued on more than one occasion, the average American was 30 times richer than the average Chinese. But today, the average American is just five times richer than the average Chinese. And if the OECD's projections are to be believed, within just a few decades, that ratio will be down to two to one. The shift that we are witnessing away from Western triumph towards something more like a balanced world is the most important historical event of our lifetimes. And what I want to do this afternoon is to try to offer some historical perspectives on that great shift. What are the real drivers? What are the forces propelling the great reconvergence? I think there are two. And it helps to think of them using terminology from the realm of development economics. And if any of you here study development, what I'm about to say will seem quite familiar to you. There is a consensus though it's not universal, I'd say it was a majority opinion, amongst development economists, that the most important thing a poor country can do, if it is to become richer, is to improve its institutions. No amount of investment, no amount of aid, will achieve much if the institutions are broken, if the governance is fundamentally corrupt, 
if civil war or crime are endemic. Don't take it from me, take it from Paul Collier, my old friend at Oxford, whose work on African economic development has been some of the most important work in the field in recent years. Or Hernando de Soto, whose work on the mystery of capital has illuminated what it was that was keeping Peru poor and what it is that is keeping Egypt poor. There's a second phenomenon, though, that I want to draw your attention to. Now, one of the challenges of delivering a lecture on a sunny day, just as the holidays begin in Norway, without the assistance of fancy PowerPoint slides, is to retain the attention of your audience. And this can only be done with constant variation in your tone and <laughs> pace of speaking. Woke you up. <laughs> so the second driver of the Great Reconvergence is the more interesting because it is the less studied of the two. But it is actually the corollary of the first. If it is true that poor countries get rich by improving their institutions, surely it must also be true that rich countries become poor if their institutions get worse. I mean, who ever claimed that good institutions would just stay good forever? At the heart of Western political theory, after all, from ancient times, has been a fundamental skepticism that such would be the case. We, in fact, tend to assume quite rightly that institutions deteriorate, that republics slide into tyranny, that democracies give way to oligarchy. I want to suggest to you that a process of institutional deterioration has been going on in the West, in the rich countries. And it has been going on largely unnoticed. It is a separate phenomenon from the improvement of institutions that we see in the non-Western world. But it is as much a factor in the great reconvergence as that improvement of non-Western institutions. The first process, the improvement of non-Western institutions, is a good thing. We should welcome it. The second process, the deterioration of Western institutions, is a bad thing, and we should fight it. Let me say a few words about process number one, and then turn to process number two, the one that worries me. In the last book that I published, Civilization, the West and the Rest, I made an argument about what had caused the great divergence, what had made the West so much richer and stronger than everybody else. And then I tried to show that that also explained the end of Western predominance, the reconvergence, as I've called it. I made the argument in a somewhat facile sounding way in the hope of interesting my teenage children in my research. I said to them, there were six things that the West developed. Let's call them the six killer apps. This was to engage their interest. Because as you probably noticed, if you have teenage children, while you're talking to them, they're doing this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Really? Uh-huh. Oh, Dad, can you lend me some money? <laughs> to get their attention, I said, there were six killer apps, and they looked up. Six things that evolved in the West before they evolved anywhere else. And these six things explain the great divergence. They were, one, competition. <laughs> 
The idea that competition is legitimate in the economic and political sphere and that monolithic empires are not preferable. To the scientific revolution, with the experimental method at its heart. Three, the rule of law based on private property rights. Four, modern medicine with its amazing capacity to double and then more than double life expectancy. Five, the consumer society, without which there is no point having an industrial revolution. And six, the work ethic, the notion that work is edifying and uplifting in itself. My argument was that these six collapse, these six ideas and institutions, arose in the West from around 1500 and were largely monopolized by Western civilization into the 20th century. When Max Weber wrote about the spirit of capitalism, he assumed it must have a Protestant ethic because he couldn't really see the work ethic anywhere else but in Northern Europe and North America. The great reconvergence began when the non-Western world started to download the killer apps because it turned out to be open source software. Anybody could copy the killer apps who wanted to. The Japanese were the first to try to do this. Meiji uh, era Japan systematically sought to copy everything about the West. They weren't sure what the crucial things were, so they copied everything, including the way we dress, the way we brush our teeth, the funny music we like, the dances we do. They copied it all. As a strategy, this was successful because in the process, they also copied the things that mattered. And within a very short space of time, theirs was the first non-Western economy and the first non-Western state to be able to compete with the European and North American empires. Unfortunately, they made the mistake of thinking that empire was one of the killer apps. As I've tried to show in much of my work, empire is the least original thing that Europeans did. Everybody did empire. Empire cannot have explanatory significance in the Great Divergence because Europeans were latecomers to the imperial game. Empire is a red herring of historical explanation, if only the left would see this. I would be spared much abuse. <laughs> Empire is as irrelevant to the Great Divergence as race. A hundred years ago, if we had had a meeting like this, a majority of people in the room would have agreed with the proposition that the West was richer and stronger because it was racially superior. That was not only the conventional wisdom, that was the elite informed wisdom. We now know it to be completely wrong. The reason that institutions matter is that they dominate everything else. Race, geography, the weather, your color, it doesn't matter. If you have the right institutions, you achieve growth. And from growth, much else follows. We know this to be true because we ran two experiments just to prove the point. In the middle of this past century, we divided the Germans in two and the Koreans in two. We gave one set communist institutions and the other set capitalist institutions. And within an incredibly short space of time, behavior completely diverged as did economic outcomes. The geography was the same, the national culture was the same, the DNA was pretty much the same on both sides of those two divides, but a great divergence happened in microcosm in both Germany and Korea. Institutions matter. And the institutions are really at the heart of my argument about killer applications. If you look at the world today, competitiveness is no longer something that the West dominates. In fact, according to the World Economic Forum, which has a competitiveness index, the competitiveness of the United States has declined by about 7% since 2006, and the competitiveness of China has increased by about 14%. Science, technology, 
if you just look at patents granted by country of applicant, Japan has been ahead of the United States for more than a decade. China is now in third position. It overtook Germany in 2009. Very few Germans believe this, but it's true. The rule of law is no longer something that can be claimed to be a Western monopoly. On the contrary, as I'm going to show you, by almost any measure, the rule of law is in better shape in Hong Kong than it is in New York City. Asian life expectancy has, in some cases, overtaken that of the West. The consumer society has moved east. If you don't believe me, take a trip to Hong Kong, which is now really just a giant shopping mall connected by a subway system. There are, in the world, some very large shopping malls. The biggest in the world, there are 30, according to the Merrill Lynch League table of shopping malls. Only three of the 30 are in the United States. All the others are in what we call emerging markets. The consumer society maxed out in the West. It's pretty hard to be a consumer when you are leveraged to the hilt and your balance sheet won't let you borrow any more. As for the work ethic, well, here we are. Most Norwegians are now on holiday. You're the last remaining working Norwegians. <laughs> and only I'm, in fact, working because you're just listening. If you look at working hours per annum, it's very clear that the work ethic doesn't live here in Europe anymore, nor in North America. The average South Korean works nearly 1,000 hours more per year than the average German. And that's why, when South Koreans do get to go on vacation, the Germans are already there. <laughs> and when the South Koreans go back to Seoul, the Germans stay for at least another two weeks. So the work ethic has relocated. The six killer apps don't live here anymore. Or if they do, we have to share them. And this is good. It is great for hundreds of millions of people all over the world, in China, in India, in Brazil, to have finally got somewhere closer to working institutions. It means that the centuries of economic stagnation have ended. The centuries in which per capita GDP in China did not grow, or in fact declined, are over. We should celebrate that. We should do nothing to stop it. But there is a second process at work, as I mentioned, a process whereby Western institutions deteriorate. You can download the killer apps. You can also delete them. Or you can fail to upgrade them so that it stops working. I want to suggest to you that this is as powerful a force in the story of the Great Divergence, but unlike the downloading of the killer apps by the rest, the deterioration, or better expressed, degeneration of Western institutions is a deeply troubling phenomenon about which we should all worry. What do I mean by this? The title of my book, The Great Degeneration, is a pun on the word generation. As you know, Americans love to celebrate their role in World War II, an event at which they turned up rather late, with the phrase the great, de uh, the great generation. The great generation is the generation that fought World War II. So the great degeneration is a pun on that phrase. And it's a pun inspired by the reality that in most Western societies, and particularly in the United States, a huge breach of contract between the generations is being perpetrated. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're young, 
and since I'm 49, that's practically all of you. If you're young, you should be very worried. You should be very worried indeed. Because your grandparents and parents around the world have been quietly living at your expense without admitting it. The great debates that rage in so many Western countries, not in resource-rich, fiscally prudent Norway, but believe me, almost everywhere else, debates about debt, about deficits, about entitlements, about austerity, about stimulus, all of this, all of this is noise. The signal behind the noise is a breach of contract between the generations. The baby boomers have been living for decades at the expense of the young and the unborn. Edmund Burke, the great Irish political philosopher, wrote in his Reflections on the Revolution in France, the real social contract is not between the classes or between the people and the sovereign. It is between the generations, between the living and the dead and the unborn. Throughout most of Western history, the living were respectful of that contract in both directions, mindful of the past, for, forever thoughtful of the future, saving for the future, investing for the future, innovating for the future, sacrificing for the future. Thrift, the whole point of thrift in the Victorian age was the future. At some point after 1945, the contract between the living and the unborn got broken, and the result we see today. According to the International Labour Organization, youth unemployment in the Eurozone is 23%. Americans think that this is a European problem, but the unemployment rate for young people in the United States is not much lower, it's 18%. Consumption per capita in the United States for the over 70s is twice consumption per capita for the under 20s. The same goes for government spending per capita. Government spends twice as much on the elderly per capita as on the young, on kids in the United States. If you wanted to achieve generational balance, that is to say, if you wanted to ensure that future generations paid the same amount of tax and received the same benefits as the current generation, here's what you would have to do in the United States. And I'll give the United States as an example, but I want to make it very clear that the same calculations could be made for most European countries and they would be equally horrible. Either you have to immediately and permanently cut all government spending by 35%, or you have to immediately and permanently increase all federal taxes by 64%. That is the only way, according to my good friend Larry Kotlikoff at Boston University, that you could achieve generational balance in the United States today. And if you don't do it, if you wait 10 years, you'll have to do even bigger cuts or even bigger tax hikes. That is the reality. Do not be deceived by the noise in the newspapers about sequesters and falling deficits and, oh, the fiscal problem's gone away. It hasn't. The magnitude of the fiscal problem is grossly understated by estimates of the debt-to-GDP ratio because they do not include the unfunded liabilities of Medicare, Social Security, and so on. And the same is true of most Western countries on the other side of the Atlantic. Who is more important, granddad or junior? Very few political posters convey questions like that. This will soon change. The fundamental conflict at the heart of most democracies today is between the generations. But we don't have the vocabulary to deal with this because our language is the language of class or the language of percentiles. Oh, I'm in the 1%. Oh, he's in the 47%. As if percentiles rule the world. But slowly, gradually, we must transition to a generation-based politics because the conflicts that are at the heart of our democracy are conflicts between the generations. Friedrich von Hayek in the Constitution of Liberty predicted in a not well-known passage that the welfare state would end this way, that the welfare state would turn out to be an enormous Ponzi scheme in which the elderly lived at the expense of the young. 
He was one of the very few writers in the 1950s to see this. But he was wrong about what would happen. Hayek said, remembering World War II, the young run the army and the police. At some point, they'll round up the elderly and put them into camps. <laughs> wrong. It's the young who've been rounded up and put into unemployment and put into the dependency culture of welfare. It's the young who are the losers so far. That is the first example of institutional degeneration I want to talk about. The second is rather different. It has to do with regulation. Many people have become convinced through specious argumentation that the financial crisis of 2007 to well about now was caused by deregulation and therefore regulation is the answer. This is completely wrong despite the fact that most people I meet believe it. In reality, the financial crisis was caused by regulation. Bad, over-complex regulation. And I want to emphasize this point because it's vital that we understand that the crisis occurred in the most regulated parts of the financial system, not in the unregulated parts. Banks on both sides of the Atlantic were highly regulated, both at the national and at the international level. Government-sponsored entities like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which underwrote the mortgage market in the United States, which was the epicenter of the crisis, were highly regulated institutions under the direct supervision of the US Congress. Hedge funds did not cause the financial crisis. The financial crisis was caused by the fact that the regulations did not work and the regulators were either bought or were asleep. Until we recognize that regulation is the disease of which it purports to be the cure, to paraphrase Karl Krauss's famous critique of psychoanalysis, we will keep making the same mistake. What has happened since the crisis? More regulation. The Dodd-Frank bill, Basel III. Did you know that Basel III is more than an order of magnitude larger in page numbers than Basel I. Do you think it will be an order of magnitude more effective? Me neither. The Dodd-Frank bill covers nearly a thousand pages, not including all the regulations that it has since spawned. Do you think it will make another financial crisis not happen? Me neither. The growth of complex regulation is one of the pathologies of the modern West. Let me illustrate the point with a simple measure. If you exclude the blank pages, the Federal Register, which is a compendium of all regulations in the United States, federal regulations, covers 78,961 pages. Well, back in 1936, it was just 2,620. Well, you say to me, of course, the economy's grown enormously since then. There must need to be more regulation. Don't be stupid. You're quite right. The US economy is 12 times larger today than it was in 1936, allowing for inflation. But guess what? The Federal Register is 30 times larger. Regulation breeds. There are 63 different government agencies, departments, commissions, you name it, whose raison d'etre is to produce regulation in the United States alone. There has only been one period since the war when regulation shrank in the United States, when the Federal Register actually got shorter, and that was in the presidency of Ronald Reagan, when it shrank by 30%. In all other periods, in every other presidency, since Harry Truman, the volume of regulation has grown. Democrat, Republican, makes no difference. This is a phenomenon we encounter everywhere in the Western world, the pathology of complex regulation. It's related to the belief that if every single contingency is covered by a regulation, then your ass is covered too. <laughs> <laughs> 
But this has an unintended consequence. It's expensive. Regulation costs the US economy today $1.8 trillion a year. That's on the basis of the government's own figures. That's equivalent to an invisible surcharge on all federal taxes of 35%. It's close to 12% of GDP. And guess what? It weighs more heavily on small business than on large business. Per employee, it's 36% more expensive if you employ 20 people or fewer than if you employ 500 people or more. Is anybody here, does anybody here run a business? Two. Me. Four. Okay. Uh, it's, don't be ashamed. I'm actually quite proud of it. So I don't know how it is in Norway, but the biggest problem of running a business in the United States is the regulation nation. And this problem is one of the reasons that it is becoming harder to do business in many Western countries at a time when it's getting easier to do it in non-Western countries. Let me illustrate the point. The World Bank produces seven different measures that relate to the ease of doing business that are measured in terms of days. Number of days it takes you to start a business. Suppose you decide to start a business. I don't know how many days it takes in Norway to start a business, but you could find out. So if you take the seven different things that the World Bank measures in days, start a business, get an import license, recover a debt that some bugger hasn't repaid you, add those things together, and you have a pretty handy index for how easy it is to do business. Well, in 2006, it would have taken you 368 days to do all seven things sequentially in the United States. But today, it's 433 days. It's gone up by 18% in that short space of time. There are only 21 countries in the world where it has got harder to do business by this measure. The United States is one of them. So is Burundi. So is Yemen. Ease of doing business is a good measure of the cost of regulation. And in the United States, we haven't even hit Obamacare. That's next year's treat in store. The other thing that really drives you crazy if you're running a small business in the United States is lawyers. Are there any lawyers here? Okay. You're not going to like this bit at all. In fact, it applies more to the US than to Europe. In the US, the legal profession is out of control. It is a rent-seeking elite that extracts its rents in a variety of ways. It doesn't even need super complex regulation to do it. It can do it just fine through the tort system. If you were in an American audience, I would now tell you at great length uh, about the egregious abuse of the tort system. Since you're a Norwegian audience, I will spare you. Suffice to say that if you look at the 22 different measures of institutional quality that the World Economic Forum puts together, when it's constructing its competitiveness index. These are everything from investor protection through intellectual property rights to criminality, all of that stuff. It's amazing how badly the United States fares in international comparison. Hong Kong beats the US on 22 out of 22 counts. In most categories, the US isn't even in the world's top 30. The fourth problem about institutional degeneration is not specifically American. It is the problem of the decline of civil society. One of the things that made Western civilization remarkably dynamic in its glory days was the extent to which citizens would solve problems through voluntary association rather than by appealing to the state. Robert Putnam, in Bowling Alone, identified the decline of the voluntary association in the United States. He first published an essay on the subject in 1995. Since 1995, the downward trend has only continued. Fewer and fewer Americans and fewer and fewer Europeans are active members of voluntary associations. Being on Facebook is not a substitute at all. In fact, there's good academic research that shows 
that Facebook is only really an effective tool of mobilization if it is added on top of pre-existing real associations. Everything else is illusory. Friends who aren't friends, networks that can organize. What we see in the decline of civil society is the obverse of the growth of the welfare state. And this growth has become pathological, whatever the good intentions of its creators were. The growth, for example, in the share of the US population dependent on social security invalidity benefits is a very startling thing. I was amazed to find that 6% of Americans my age, 6% are now recipients of invalidity benefit. That's more than double the proportion back in the 1980s. Did people get less healthy? Did work get more strenuous? Actually, no. We know that people have become more healthy and that work has got easier thanks to the transition from manufacturing to services. Something funny is at work here. What is most troubling about the decline of civil society is its association with social immobility. Scandinavians have reason to be proud of the relatively high social mobility that their societies enjoy. In all international comparisons, Scandinavian countries score much better than English-speaking countries. But what is really startling to discover is that social mobility in the United States is now lower than it is in the United Kingdom. England, home of the class system, is being eclipsed by the United States, where the probability of your getting out of the bottom quintile if you're born into it is now around 1 in 13, compared with 1 in 8 for the United Kingdom. What is going on here is a chronic educational failure. Again, this is not something that Scandinavian countries suffer from, but you're unusual in that. Most Western societies are suffering from a major failure in secondary education. This shows up in the PISA scores, but the PISA scores actually somewhat understate the effect. According to the PISA study, which was last done in 2009, the gap in mathematical attainment between 15-year-olds in Shanghai and 15-year-olds in the United States is as big as the gap between the Americans and Albanians or Tunisians. Most English-speaking countries are clustered around the middle of the table now, and the problem's not confined to the Anglosphere. Scandinavians are unusual because they're up there close to the East Asians, who are now the world leaders in mathematical attainment. This matters because education is the key to social mobility. If you have a really bad education from early childhood through to your teens, your chances of escaping from the bottom quintile of the income distribution are trivially small. Civil society could have solved this problem in the way that it used to solve similar problems by creating new and better schools. But where state monopolies exist in secondary education, that doesn't happen. And oddly enough, in the United States, more than in most European countries, it's the teachers' unions that are doing their level best to prevent competition, changing the chances of poor kids when it comes to escaping from dependency and poverty. In these four different ways, Western institutions have been getting worse. Our public finances in most Western countries reflect a huge breach of contract between the generations. Our regulations have become complex to the point of dysfunctional in many areas of economic life. The rule of law is not what it was. And civil society is failing in one of its primary tasks, which is to ensure social mobility. Thus far, I've emphasized the degeneration of American institutions. But let me say a few words before I close about Europe. It's conventional to argue that Europe's problems today are fiscal or have to do with banks, but these two are symptoms of underlying problems. If you look at the rule of law or the problem of corruption, one of the most striking things of the last 20 years is that there has been divergence and not convergence in Europe. Whatever monetary union was supposed to achieve, it did not bring about a convergence in institutional standards. 
The gap between Northern Europe, between Scandinavia, and Southern Europe, let's say Italy, has widened drastically since the late 1990s. Most discussions in Europe overlook this problem. We have, as in the United States, reduced our policy debate to an argument about monetary and fiscal technicalities, missing altogether the profound structural and institutional problems that are really bedeviling our economies. I mentioned ease of doing business, and I told you that it now takes 433 days to do seven basic business procedures in the United States. In Italy, the same seven procedures will take you 1,500 days. That compares with Finland, where you can do it all in 420. How can there be a meaningful European integration with this kind of institutional disintegration? Not everything in Scandinavia is perfect. One of the most striking features of the labor markets uh, of Northern Europe is the huge mismatch between unemployment rates for native-born and non-native-born workers. As you are doubtless aware, the unemployment rate for foreign-born workers in this country is more than two and a half times higher than the unemployment rate for the native-born. The same is true in Sweden, it is also true, however, in Belgium, in Austria. Indeed, it is true in most of continental Europe. Why does this matter? It matters because the failure of integration in many European countries is creating potential explosions of the sort we have seen in limited form already in the suburbs of Stockholm this year. Well, for most of this lecture, I've given you bad news. I've told you about the things that are going wrong in the West that explain why 1989 did not usher in a new era of Western triumph. I want to conclude with some cheering thoughts. Well, <laughs> kind of cheering. As the rest improve their institutions, there are going to be bumps in the road. It is not easy to transition to the rule of law from a one-party state. That is the challenge that China faces today. And the rule of law has a very long way to go before it is established in most of the major Asian economies in anything like a way comparable with the West. Moreover, as we're seeing in North Africa and the Middle East, a revolutionary moment hailed in the West as a spring could turn quickly, perhaps already has turned quickly, into an Islamist winter. The rule of Sharia law, strongly favored by large majorities in most of the countries of the region, is not the same as the rule of law as I tried to discuss it earlier. So things are not going to be easy in the rest of the world. And we may already be seeing in cities as far apart as, as Istanbul and Sao Paulo, a kind of revolution of rising expectations that could blow the ascent of the rest quite badly off course. I, so, I said it was kind of good news. There is some light in the Western gloom. The aging phenomenon is not universal. It's much less pronounced in the United States than it is in many European countries, thanks in part to immigration and in part to fertility. And the United States has just got lucky again in the sense that it has discovered energy resources that had previously been regarded as technologically or unequally viable. Shale gas and tight oil do change the game in all kinds of significant ways, though I think it may be premature to refer to the United States as Saudi America. Crucially, and this is the final point, this reduction in America's dependence on the fossil fuel resources of the Middle East creates a dual geopolitical challenge for the post-Cold War world. Since the Cold War, indeed since the time of Henry Kissinger, whose biography I'm writing, the United States has played a hegemonic role in the Middle East. It has been, for good or ill, the policeman. We have entered a phase in which that will no longer be true, 
and the clear direction of policy under President Obama is strategic retreat. As I try to argue in a book entitled War of the World, it's when empires retreat that violence tends to spike. Be careful what you wish for, you anti-imperialists. And this is already proving to be true, as we see in Syria. The dual geopolitical problem is what China will do. Because after all, as the US diminishes its dependence on imported energy, so China increases its energy dependence. No one in Beijing really knows the answer to the question, what will China do? But there will have to be an answer. And on that answer will hinge much of what we come to look back on as, who knows, the cool war, a phrase coined by my friend Noah Feldman to characterize the new and strained relationship between China and the United States. I want to end with a quotation. It comes from the Secretary of State John Kerry. He was alluding to one of the less well-known rights that Americans enjoy, so little known that it doesn't in fact appear in the Bill of Rights. Addressing a group of Berlin students in February, John Kerry said, and I quote, in America, you have a right to be stupid if you want to be. I think he intended this as a joke, but you should know, never make a joke in Germany. <laughs> His audience were carefully taking notes and they continued to do so. Dummheitsberg, sehr interessant. But there was a point there that was more than a joke. All the problems that I have described to you in this lecture are solvable. None of this is written in the stars or in our DNA or anywhere else. These are institutional problems, man and woman made, and men and women can fix them. The problem of public finances can be fixed. The problem of excessive regulation can be fixed. We can improve our rule of law. We can rejuvenate our civil society and make the education of America as good as the education of Scandinavia. All of this can be done. I am not telling you a deterministic or declinist story, but as John Kerry said, America and indeed the West as a whole reserves the right to be stupid. And until we identify the true causes of our relative decline, we will go on exercising that right. Thank you very much. <laughs>
you could, you could make this case that, uh, yes, Asia has risen, China has risen, and this is uh, the overwhelming factor of our time. But the challenges that Asia, and particularly China, will be facing, as you believe, is yet are even bigger, actually much bigger, than the four factors you enumerate. The uh, prediction game, as you say, is, is a dangerous one for historians who should concern themselves exclusively with the past. However, the past is our only available meaningful guide to the future. And most of my career I've spent occasionally, at least, using historical analogies to think about the future. The first thing you understand when you do that is that there's no such thing as the future in singular. There are multiple futures, and it's our hard task collectively to choose one of them. So when I make any statement about the future, I'm usually implicitly offering at least two, and usually more than two scenarios, and then trying to attach probabilities to them. In, in practice, you only need to be right, say, 51% uh, of the time to make money. Uh, in the prediction game, outside of uh, finance, it's very interesting how, how little it matters whether you're right or wrong. Public intellectuals have made brilliant careers on a series of totally erroneous predictions. Uh, and conversely, being right has never really done me any good at all. Uh, it's curious how few people remember how right I was in my book on American Empire, Colossus, uh, because it's far more amusing to pretend that I was some jingoistic neoconservative. Having said all that, let me remind you of a great remark of Winston Churchill's on the subject of the United States. Churchill, who was of course half American, himself said, the United States will always do the right thing when all the alternatives have been exhausted. <laughs> and I, I think there's tremendous amount of truth in that because what I see in the United States where I've now lived for about 10 years is a constant process of exhausting the alternatives. Finally, having exhausted all the alternatives, I think the United States will do the right thing. It may even slowly be beginning to do the right thing in at least some areas, energy being one. So it would be a reckless pundit who predicted the inexorable decline of the United States. And I myself, see a, a turning point, an inflection point, in the relatively near future as the US takes advantage of its uh, advantages uh, in resources in terms of demography to do the institutional reforms I'm talking about. And this book is supposed to contribute to that process by focusing people's minds on what is actually wrong. Much of the discussion at the last election in the US was completely off the point. Republicans didn't talk as they should have talked about the breakdown of social mobility. They became entirely trapped in an argument about entitlements that they could only lose. Having said all that, my confidence about the United States does not extend to Europe, where I see dark times ahead. And it's very hard indeed for the West to survive if only one half of it prospers. If the United States can address the problems I've described, the big question is, can Europe? And the odds in Europe's case are much worse. The demographics are terrible. The energy option may be there, but it won't be exercised. So the dependence on imported oil uh, and gas shows no sign of diminishing. And at the heart of Europe is an, uh, an abominable institutional mess. In the prediction game, as I've said, the rewards for being right are too few. But I'm not too modest uh, to omit the fact that I was completely right about monetary union. In the late 1990s, I and a few others pointed out that having a monetary union without any fiscal union would fail. Larry Kotlikoff and I wrote a piece for foreign affairs in which we said, this will work for 10 years and then fall apart. We got the timing exactly right. Probably a bit of luck was involved. But broadly speaking, our analysis was correct, that the fiscal, lack of fiscal coordination would be fatal. And here we are. I doubt very much that there is a quick fix for the mess that has been made by the European Union. 
Uh, and indeed, when I look at the scenarios for the monetary union, there is still a pretty significant probability that the whole thing falls apart. Let's put it at 10 to 15 percent. They are far from being out of the woods. You are in the happy position of not being a part of this mess, but it's right next door, and it can't be irrelevant to your future prospects. You are in the unhappy position of having no say at all in the way this thing is fixed or not fixed. So my sense is that the glass is half full or half empty according to temperament. The United States will almost certainly turn itself around. It may take a few more years to find the political leadership to do that, but eventually it will show up. For Europe, I'm much more pessimistic. And after all, that's where we are today. It's interesting that you, you men mention Margaret Thatcher. Uh, I've thought a lot about her since her death and reflected on what the lessons of 1980s Britain are. One obvious lesson is that structural reform, as we now euphemistically call it, is extremely politically difficult. And it requires very courageous leadership and a measure of luck to pull it off. If Margaret Thatcher had not been blessed by the stupidity of the Argentine junta, uh, who chose to invade the Falkland Islands shortly before she had to seek re-election, she would have been a one-term prime minister. Between 1979 and 1982, the Thatcher government did an extraordinary series of things, more or less simultaneously. They addressed the problem of inflation through monetarist policy at the Bank of England. They addressed the problem of the excessive power of the trade unions, although the full showdown came somewhat later. They addressed the problem of chronic uh, public deficits through very radical fiscal reform. The medicine was bitter. Unemployment went up. There was a deep recession as the inflation psychology was broken. And as I've said, the popularity of the government plummeted. And yet, only that kind of leadership will work. Only that kind of conviction will see a government through the kind of reforms that, frankly, most governments in Europe and indeed in North America are going to have to make. I'll take the case of Italy because it's, in some ways, the worst case. When I say that the rule of law in Italy declined steeply from the late 1990s, yesterday's verdict on the former prime minister kind of exemplifies what I'm talking about. To reform Italy is going to require more than what Gerhard Schröder did to the German labor market. Italy's reforms need to be root and branch to extend from the top to the bottom. It's not just a technical labor market problem. It's a rule of law problem. And it's going to take a far stronger government than the one that we currently see in Rome to do it. Is that government likely anytime soon? It's hard to be optimistic. So my, my regret, regretful conclusion is that the, the, uh, the Juncker calculation dominates in European politics. Nobody has the courage, including Angela Merkel, to risk defeat in elections. And so they pursue policies that are, by their very nature, guaranteed not to yield meaningful results. And since they usually lose anyway, with the exception of Angela Merkel, it's kind of doomed as a strategy. It may be that, that European democracies are no longer capable of producing effective and courageous leadership. And that's a possibility that we really need to, to take seriously. When I look 
at the quality of European politicians, it's hard to feel excitement. There are very few that I have met in the last five years who show any sign of having the kind of properties that made Margaret Thatcher such an extraordinarily successful leader. I'll name one. Poland's Foreign Minister, Radek Sikorski, is a rare exception to the rule. If I could make him president of the European Union and confer on him the powers of a British Prime Minister, I would do it tomorrow. But what is really sad is that he's the only name that springs to mind. Thanks. back in the prediction business. <laughs> well, let's use history to help us. Currently, the dysfunctional monetary union is inflicting depression levels of unemployment and higher than depression <coughs> levels of youth unemployment on most southern European countries. There's really no end in sight to this because both the fiscal and monetary policies uh, ensure continued credit contraction in southern Europe. One lesson of the depression is that depression is contagious. And this depression is actually spreading. And when it spreads, as it has, I think, in many ways already to France, uh, we will see the next phase of the European crisis begin. As France is relegated from core to periphery where it belongs, the whole structure of the European Union will be called fundamentally into question. This is a matter of months away, perhaps even weeks. I was in Paris just a few weeks ago. The Hollande government is, is like something out of the 1930s in many ways. It is such incompetence, such a lack of courage, as I have seldom seen in a West European country. And the beneficiaries of the Front National, the National Front. Using history again as our guide, the depression spreads the populists gain. Can the populists gain power, though? That's not so obvious. In one respect, we're different from the 1930s. We have an anti-populist mechanism in place. Jörg Haider was the first to find this. The populists gain at the polls, do well in the elections, but they cannot form governments. And it may be in that respect that there's a check on what can go wrong. But if one populist government is formed, the next phase of the tragedy will unfold. What will happen? At some point, somebody is going to say the unsayable and say we'd be better off outside this monetary union. The great mistake last year was to think it might be a small country like Greece. Small countries don't have that bargaining power. The big countries do. Either Spain or Italy would be better out of the Eurozone, I'm quite sure. It would be painful in the short term, but it would get them out uh, of the mess at some point fairly soon after that. So the next phase of the story is somebody says the unsayable. There's a run on the Spanish banks, and it's game over for the euro. You asked for a worst case scenario. I said this is a 10% probability scenario. So it's quite a high probability. The only thing that's keeping the Spanish banks alive is the inexplicable inertia of Spanish depositors. I thought Cyprus would cause them to run. But you know, people are. People are always a little lazy when it comes to changing their banks. At some point, that will change, though, and people who speak Spanish know what happened in Argentina, as well as what happened in Cyprus. So with the breakdown of the Eurozone, there'll be a period of at least a year of total chaos. And in that period, others will obviously leave. The whole thing will be very powerfully centrifugal. 
and the opportunity for populists to say the European elites are frauds as well as crooks will be irresistible and we will see major gains on the political extremes, both left and right. The left will do better in some countries, the right will do better in others. And finally, my worst case scenario will conclude with many, many more outbreaks of urban violence between, predominantly between immigrants radicalized by uh, Islam and uh, young white, unskilled, unemployed. Uh, at which point we will have pulled off an amazing feat, uh, the feat of rerunning the 1930s in Europe, when the entire historical profession spent uh, a very large part of the last half century trying to prevent that from happening and telling itself that by teaching the lessons of the 1930s we'd avoid their repetition. The richest irony of all is that the, pro progr the whole program of European integration was supposed to make this impossible, but because of incredibly faulty design and indeed downright stupidity on the part of the people who came up with the idea of the monetary union, we've made it much more likely to happen again. I could go on. <laughs> Ask me for the upside. Thanks very much for those two excellent points. I'm actually going to make a request uh, to Ulse. Is there any way of opening some windows? Because I know saunas are popular in this part of, uh, of the world, but uh, I always thought it was something that you did, you know, <coughs> naked rather than a suit. I can't, like President Obama, take my jacket off because I have a microphone attached to it. So I'm going to... <coughs> the issue of crony capitalism which was something Americans loved to accuse Asians of in 1997, has come back to haunt the United States. And had I had more time, I would have talked about that, as I do in the book. Part of the, the measure of rule of law that I discussed from the World Economic Forum includes measures of corruption. The world governance indicators are also very damning on this. So are the data from the Fraser Institute. The US has become a corrupt country. You could say it's become a Latin American country, except that some Latin American countries have actually been improving institutionally, even as the US has been getting worse. And uh, nothing again illustrates the plight of conservatives more than their inability to, to use terms like crony capitalism to criticize what has been going on between Washington and Wall Street. Since Wall Street was able to buy both parties, it's extremely hard to make that argument. But my own view has been for 
really uh, longer than the crisis. I, I wrote about this in the Ascent of Money, that the relationship between Wall Street and Washington is, is really toxic. And there is, at this point, no sign of any improvement in that regard. Indeed, Dodd-Frank was largely written by the lobbyists and their, and their creatures in Congress. It's an extremely depressing thing because uh, that explains the complexity of the legislation. There's a nexus between complexity and cronyism. If you make regulation really complicated, then only the big guys can actually understand how to navigate their way through it because they have the compliance department and they have the lawyers. Goldman Sachs isn't worried about Dodd-Frank. The people who are worried about Dodd-Frank are the people who want to start new banks. It's almost impossible to do because the entry barriers to new banks are unassailably high. The too big to fail institutions monopolize the free money from the Fed and they have the regulatory thing completely down. So it's a huge and deeply worrying problem. And it is the kind of problem that will be very, very difficult to solve within the existing political system. Again, you need the Thatcher factor. You need the kind of politician who will lead against even the people who finance the campaign. In the United States, it probably needs somebody prepared to be a one-term president to do this stuff. But if it's done right, it's a two-term presidency. On your broader question about global rebalancing, let me, uh, let me half agree with you. Part of what we are seeing in the Great Reconvergence is a rebalancing. And part of what the financial crisis has done has been to accelerate that process in a number of ways. Uh, number one, it's forcing countries that ran very large current account deficits to stop doing that. And most analysts saw those deficits as the biggest global imbalances uh, that we should worry about. Two, the crisis is actually pretty much ending the China price, that plus the demographics in China. So. If you look at patterns of outsourcing, the tide already has turned, and quite a lot of manufacturing jobs will be created in North America. I include Mexico in that, because Mexico can now, in fact, compete with China, which it really couldn't do for more than 10 years. So this rebalancing is, in your sense, I think, happening. But there's a big caveat. At the Bank of International Settlements conference last, the end of last week, I was involved in a, an interesting discussion about capital flows. And you need to make a distinction here between the current account deficits and surpluses, which everybody used to fixate on, and the capital flows, which are only partly linked to those. Planet finance is still very big. This was a term I used in my book, The Ascent of Money. This huge superstructure of financial institutions ranging from banks, through funds, through sovereign wealth funds, all the way uh, to the derivatives market, is enormous in relation to the global economy. And indeed, nothing has really altered that relationship. Capital flows dominate current account surpluses and deficits. And these flows at the moment are uh, moving very rapidly in new directions. The market action that began really a few weeks ago when Ben Bernanke first hinted at tapering quantitative easing are going to cause huge disruptions in the coming weeks as markets readjust to a new monetary environment. I would say the collision between the Fed, the, Bank of, the People's Bank of China, which is trying to tighten shadow banking, the Bank of Japan, which is pursuing an aggressive currency depreciation strategy, and the ECB, which is essentially gridlocked by European politics, this combination is pretty horrible in terms of what capital flows will do in response. And we will see some further very big moves in markets as, real, as capital is reallocated to take account of these different, these different forces. Hold on tight, because very few markets will be unaffected by this, and indeed, Smaller economies will be buffeted a great deal as currencies, stock markets, and bond markets try to find a new, a new equilibrium. So the world may look more balanced in some ways, but believe me, it isn't. <laughs>
question. I, I, I think that the answer is that you should read not only the wealth of nations, but the theory of moral sentiments that Smith always devised, always conceived of his work on the market as being part of a wider project to understand all the human institutions. He never finished the project, but at least the, the work on civil society is, is there with its emphasis on, on empathy uh, as the basis for human interactions outside the market. I, I'm a Smith uh, devotee, and I think that's the right approach. Smith always understood the market as being embedded institutionally. It, it's not possible, as it were, to, to float without institutional, uh, political and, and civil society support. So the challenge we face is how to simultaneously have dynamic markets that are innovative, that allocate capital optimally, uh, that allow price discovery and competition, all of these things are, are valuable for the reasons that Smith gave, and at the same time have a vibrant civil society. And I think the answer to the, the, the question requires help from thinkers other than, than Smith. In the book, I mean, I should make this clear, I act as a burglar of other people's ideas uh, because I'm just a historian, I'm not a great economic or political thinker. So I, I call on Smith, as, as I always do, but I also call on Darwin to try to understand the evolutionary forces at work in economic as well as natural life. And I bring in Badger, Walter Badger, to think about regulation, very illuminating, to go back to his view of how financial markets should be regulated. And I talk, um, I talk about the rule of law in, in, in Charles Dickens's terms. Uh, in the third chapter, but you know the clincher in the whole argument is actually Tocqueville. Let me say a few words about my debt to, to Alexis de Tocqueville. Tocqueville understood the problem about the state better than almost anybody. He saw in democracy in America that civil society would suffer if the state became too powerful. There's this terrific passage that you may know at the end of book two where he describes uh, the state in a dystopian future, all-powerful, but not coercive, gentle, nurturing, taking care of one's all, uh, every need, and thereby killing enterprise, and killing initiative, and reducing citizens to the status of sheep. This passage, when I reread it, I think I first read it as an undergraduate, when I reread it last year, made me sit up with my spine tingling, because there was a vision, a vision, a truly prophetic vision of the future. And we have reached that future. We thought we were doing the right thing by creating this powerful state. And we thought that having security from the cradle to the grave would be a good idea. But actually, it's not. It's a bad idea. And the bigger the state has become, the weaker civil society in every case, in every country. It's almost a perfect inverse relationship. So we can't really expect to have what my prime minister calls a big society, meaning civil society, if we have a big state. They're mutually exclusive. So I, I, I don't know what one does about that, except to try to hammer home the message that out of the good intentions that produced the welfare state came a whole series of unintended consequences. The unreformed welfare state creates a dependent class. It can account for anything up to a fifth of the population. It condemns them to dependency. It condemns them to bad education. It, depend it condemns them to inherited poverty. That's the unintended consequence of the system. So we have in the United States to resist the pressure to create such a state, which is very strong at the moment, and politically highly incentivized because the more people you, you make dependent on the state, the more votes you get, it's irresistible. That's how the Democratic Party works. It's called the machine, it's run out of Chicago. It's really hard to stop. And in many European countries, let me talk a little bit about my own, it's too late. I come from Scotland. Scotland's a lot like Norway, except for one small problem, union with England. And that problem which, <coughs> has been as much a benefit as a cost for most of Scottish history, became a really chronic problem from around the 1970s. Because Scotland defined itself 
in opposition to Thatcher, and by definition, therefore, defined itself as the land of welfare. When Mitt Romney made his legendary remark about the 47% of Americans who received some or other form of benefit, he didn't know quite how close to the mark he was. Because in Scotland, the equivalent percentage is 84%. The significance of the percentage is that it's non-stable. Once it's got to 47%, it's not long before it gets to 84%. That's the problem. That dynamic is extremely hard to resist because it's so politically effective. That's a long answer to, to a short question, but that's the best I can do. Well, the Scandinavian story, you've, you've got four points here. It's a bit like sitting in an examination. <laughs> the first question you asked was about Scandinavia. And I, I'm, I'm not going to pretend to know more about this than a room full of Norwegians. That would be reckless. The, the story, in any case, can be told simply because, in fact, there are big differences between, say, Norway and Finland. And so every time I see the economists talking about the Scandinavian model, I'm afraid I, you know, I reach for my revolver. The, the simplest answer I can give in the available time is this. What has been shown in Scandinavia is that relatively small homogenous societies can run highly distributed, redistributed welfare systems in which, and, and, and can generate the growth to finance them through high human capital. So having really good education, 
has been a crucial part of the success of this part of the world. And that, plus in Norway's case natural resources, has been a very powerful winning combination. There's not many countries in the world that have both natural resources and good institutions. Canada's one, Norway's another. The rest of the Scandinavians are relying mainly on the resources between their ears, and with good education, that has delivered. But when I say small homogenous societies, I mean homogenous. It's much harder to run the kind of system that you have created in these different countries with, uh, with a substantial immigrant population that you fail to integrate into your economy. And the real test of the stability of, of the Scandinavian model lies there. These discrepancies in unemployment rates, which I mentioned in my lecture, are just one symptom of the problem. To have the kind of economy that integrates immigrants successfully, you can't be the Scandinavian model. You need the American model, uh, which is a great deal more open, in which there is far easier access uh, to the employment market, and indeed far less redistribution. Here I buy David Goodhart's argument that the, the high, highly redistributive state requires high levels of homogeneity to function. When you lose that, the legitimacy soon comes into question. So much for Scandinavia. I should say that I want to think a lot more about this because it seems to me to be very crucial indeed. If, if I'm right that this is the serpent in the Scandinavian paradise, then, then we should look with, with great skepticism on claims that everybody can be Denmark. You know, when I hear the word flex security being used by French politicians, I feel skeptical to put it mildly. On investment strategies, well I had planned to show you all kinds of wonderful charts in this, in this talk, uh, but, but my host said no PowerPoint at the Nobel uh, <laughs> Institute, so no, po no PowerPoint it was, and probably that was good for me and good for you. But it meant that you missed out on my nice chart on, uh, on uh, emerging market uh, performance since 1989 versus European and American. Uh, you'd only have been wrong in 97, 98, most of the rest of the time. You'd have been really glad that you went for emerging markets. Right now, it would be probably a suicidal strategy to invest in emerging markets, but that wasn't my recommendation at all. In fact, if you want a recommendation, I would just stay long, long dollar at this point. And if you want some more advice, those treasury yields look pretty nice to me, considering that at this point, we're living in a much more deflationary world than Ben Bernanke seems to think. Third point, Robert Gordon. You know, the, the techno-pessimist view is one I'm quite sympathetic to, and I, I cite his work in the book. The problem, though, is that you have to ask yourself, where does technological innovation come from? Because it's not just somehow, as it were, falling from the sky. It, it comes from the innovative society, or not. And I think one of the crucial questions that we have to ask ourselves is what exactly is going on to slow that innovative dynamic down? Here I think Peter Thiel is more illuminating than Robert Gordon, and I urge you to look at Thiel's uh, commentary. After all, Thiel is himself an innovator, founder of, of PayPal. Thiel's uh, one of the most thoughtful people in Silicon Valley, and unusual in arguing that, in fact, technological innovation is significantly less impressive now than it was in the 1940s and 1950s. We're all fixated on this thing, um, and indeed on Twitter, but as Peter says, you know, they promised us flying cars, and they gave us 24 characters, or whatever it is, 48 characters. Um, shows you how often I tweet. The, um, the final point was Spain and Ireland. Well, that's, that's an easy one. So Spain and Ireland are in this monetary union and they get Germany's monetary policy. <laughs> Not such a great idea if you've got a massively overheating housing market. What didn't happen, it happened at the same time in Iceland, in the Baltics, in the Soviet Union, it happened all over the world, and not all over the world, and then it happened at the same time. Sure. It, it was, however, it didn't happen in Europe. And one thing is for sure, neither the Irish nor the Spanish monetary authorities had any choice about what to do. Others had choice. The Fed had a choice, and Greenspan chose not to follow the Taylor rule. He chose to keep interest rates far too low from 2002 to 2004. The Icelanders made their own uh, autonomous, disastrous mistakes. 
But in the case of Spain and Ireland, there was no free will because they had no control. So then there are many people who have come to the party and finding themselves. Sadly, there will only be time for one more question uh, because Professor Ferguson will have to get all of here. Uh, can mm -hmm. the Norwegian Atlantic Committee. Thank you. Thank you for a highly inspiring afternoon. And by the way, it's not just points in French who drove the back and forth between the two worlds in Berlin and that day one. I was also there. <laughs> it was a very interesting time. Uh, talking about the first and the second book, uh, you haven't said anything about Russia. That makes uh, Norwegian highly anxious because we are in a highly rough neighborhood. Uh, I would like to hear a little bit from your opinion. Where does Russia fit into the quotation to the Russian China defining West? Will it turn east, west, or will it operate alone? And what kind of conditions do we have to survive alone? Thank you. Well, this, this is a, a great note on which to conclude because Russia illustrates, I think, very strikingly just how important institutions are. The disastrous failure uh, of uh, the political transition in the 1990s to produce the rule of law uh, explains an awful lot of what is wrong with Russia today. And it's the real reason, I think, why Russia cannot fully take advantage of its vast natural resources. I remember doing a calculation to work out how much the known reserves of all natural resources were worth in market prices if you could sell the planet. I think it's always worth having a price in mind just in case an alien takeover bid is mounted. So the Russians come in ahead, or at least they did when I did the, the numbers um, back at the height of the commodity spike. And yet, and yet, because the Kremlin is more than crony capitalism, it's state monopoly capitalism. Uh, Russia has not been able to take full advantage of, of these opportunities and indeed has made a com completely disastrous mess uh, of its natural gas policy. I mean, Gazprom has gone from hero to zero as a company mainly because its decisions were not made on business grounds. They were made on spurious and badly thought through st strategic grounds. I was in Russia in January. I hadn't been there for a while mainly because the last time I'd been there, I had vowed never to go back. <laughs> uh, so I was talked into returning, and I, I saw some interesting signs of improvement. So although it's not in the newspapers, where the focus is always on Mr. Putin and his interesting um, private life uh, and business interests, below the level of uh, the Kremlin's uh, autocracy, there is, there is improvement. So in middle-ranking Russian towns, a middle class is going about its business, and something has definitely changed for the better. Institutionally, although it's not the rule of law, the financial system has got a lot more mature, and there are companies in, in Russia that don't look like Gazprom, like Spurbank, for example. And because Spurbank wants to be an international player, it can't be a completely corrupt uh, entity. So. I wasn't as depressed as I thought I would be by, by my, my trip to Russia. What's clear is that with poor institutions, very weak rule of law, an overpowerful executive, demographic weakness, though that has improved somewhat, mainly through migration, and, um, and political, let's say political unrealism in the sense that there is still this uh, nostalgia for the Soviet empire at least as a, as a geopolitical entity, Russia has actually pretty limited options. They exaggerated the power the natural gas gave them. That power to exert leverage over, over Europe is going to go. It's a few pipelines away from going. And secondly, they are far more vulnerable than they want us to think to China. And I think both Xi in Beijing and Putin in Moscow realize that, that there is much to be said for a, a stronger Russo-Chinese relationship, particularly in a world where the United States is weak. 
So I think what we're seeing, and it's been going on for some time, Shanghai cooperation, but now the most recent trip, uh, the most recent meeting between Xi and Putin, I think we are seeing a fundamental realignment. And Russo-Chinese friendship is going to be a force to reckon with. It's obvious how interdependent they could be. Uh, China's demand, Russia's supply, it figures. And of course, they can have great fun at the expense of a weak United States. Earlier in, in this discussion, here I'll wrap it up, I alluded to the 1970s. I think in historical perspective, 1989 wasn't such a great turning point. It seemed like it at the time, but I think actually the bigger turning points came in the 70s, the Iranian Revolution, Chinese uh, reform, the Soviet, fatal Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. The 1970s were a turning point in the West too, Thatcher, Reagan. The, these were the big inflection points. And now we're seeing a, a kind of unwinding of that era. It's unwinding in the Middle East, that Kissinger era is pretty much over there. And I think it's unwinding in the sense that the Chinese-American relationship, which was so important from 72 onwards, is gradually turning sour. And the Snowden affair illustrates just the way the cool war will play out. I don't want to claim ownership of the term cool war. As I said, Noah Feldman at Harvard Law School coined the phrase, has a book of that title. I think we're now probably in the early stages of the cool war. Uh, and in that cool war, the Russians will happily take the Chinese side whenever the opportunity presents itself. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.